loud. Oh my goodness, because I can get loud. Sound people, you're going to have, because I get excited. And y'all, if y'all know Bobby Bonner, I, it, it comes honestly. So <laughs> I'm so sorry in advance for anyone. Um, oh my goodness, I'm so glad to be here with y'all. Uh, there's, this little, there's this little YouTube video um, that I, I think is absolutely adorable. It's this little Tennessee boy, and he's probably about, I don't know, maybe four or five. And he loves to talk about fish. Anybody in here seen that video? Anybody? Oh, it's the funniest video. I wish we had it up. But and he's just sitting here, and he's caught him a bass. Okay, he has caught him a bass fish, and this bass fish, and he's, his daddy is videoing him, and his daddy's proud, right? This bass is trying to hang on for dear life. He's still alive, and he's, he's sitting there talking about this fish and all the details of this bass, and his angle fans, and his accent is just adorable, and he goes on to talk about, and this here is a female bass, and this you can tell by its belly, and it just goes, he goes on and on and on, and by this time, the daddy's like, what is going on? And, and the boy's like, he just, he never missed a beat, he is talking about this fish, and this, this, uh, the dad's like, you know, the video's here, and he's like, what is going on? What's going on? You can hear the daddy tell him, and he's like, finally, the boy looks at his dad, and he goes, what? I'm trying to talk about fish. And it's the sweetest thing ever. I mean, he even takes the fish and he goes and puts some water in its mouth and he continues to talk about the fish. Well, tonight, I just want to talk about Jesus. Okay? We're going to talk about Jesus. He's the only thing worth talking about anymore. <laughs> always has been. Always has been. Has anybody in here ever read the Bible through? Raise your hand. Anybody in here read the Bible through? All right. We're going to talk about that too. Uh, I'll just give you a brief testimony. Uh, it was August 16th, 2003. I was living in Katy, Texas, and uh, I have, my Bible is super heavy. Would you mind grabbing that? <laughs> I'm going to, that word if I hit in my heart. Well, just if I need it, Sean will bring, bring it back up here for me. All right, so uh, <clears throat> this, this will be down here by the end of the night. Uh, but what I love about all of this is just, is about Jesus. And again, August 16th, 2003, I was asking myself the question, is this all that life really has to offer me? <laughs> Anybody ever said that? Am I the only one? I'm probably the only one. Uh, <laughs>
has wanted to dwell with us. God Almighty has wanted to dwell with us. I want us to, the, the word, the scripture that our, our theme for this week, that draw near. So there's going to be three sections of this, this scripture, right? But it is good for me to draw near. It's good for you. It's good for us to come together. So we're going to go on a quest tonight. You've been handed out this, these papers, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But the word, it is good for me to draw near to God. That's what we're going we're gonna to hone in on tonight. We're going to go together hand in hand. We're going to draw near to God. Our quest is to get to the Holy of Holies. Are y'all ready? Are y'all ready? I'm ready. I'm excited. I asked the question just a minute ago, how many of you have read the Bible through? If you're reading the Bible through from Genesis to Revelations or doing it chronologically, if you're reading Genesis to Revelation, uh, you're probably ended with Judges today. Somewhere in Judges, you're about to go into Ruth. So you have gone through... I commend you. You have gone through Exodus and all of Nehemiah and all of the stuff. Like you are, this is awesome. So here you are, you've gone through this, all of the details, right, of the temple. You have, and it, y'all, don't promise me, like you tell me the truth. Did you skip? Did you skip? You skip. You, yeah, I did. I did, because I did it last year. No, I, it's true. We skip, we skip. You're like, okay, I'm like, I get it, God. You're detailed about the temple, right? I just want you to hang on to that, put it in your back pocket. All right, so from the beginning of time, from since the beginning, right? In the beginning, God. God. We could stop right there and end the service and have an altar call. In the beginning, God created, right? So Psalms 102.25 says, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. So before we, I think it's important that we establish a foundation for this weekend. So we're, we're, we're going to draw near to God. We're going to put our trust in him as we draw near. Because you can't trust somebody you don't know. Can't. It's impossible. So we got to establish a relationship with him first. Right? So then you've got... We trust in the Lord God, and so once we've known him, we get to know him just like that night on August 16th, 2003. I got to know Jesus, and it has been this quest of getting to know my Savior, and he just gets sweeter as the days go by. And so as we get to know one another, now we can declare. We get to tell somebody what Jesus has done for me. I get to tell somebody how amazing he is and what he has done, and if you've been with him a minute, you've got stories to tell. Y'all could be up here telling, probably way better than me. So Ephesians 1, 4 says, we're going to be in a lot of scripture tonight. Y'all got your swords ready. Because <laughs> listen, I don't want y'all to take my word for it. I want you to take his. According as he hath chosen, that word chosen means wanted. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So from the beginning of time, God Almighty has wanted you. He wanted you. It's personal. That scripture right here, the, the beauty of this is that it's, it's individual. It's personal. It's, it could be corporate. It could say it's good for us. It's good for us to draw near, but he's talking to you. He's talking to you. It's good for you. It's good for me to dwell, to draw near, to draw near to God. Jesus made plans to know you. He made plans to know you. It's good for me. So when I think of that word good, and Lana did a beautiful job explaining that, that out of all the things that he is, he is so good. And, and, Jesus in, in Mark chap, or Luke chapter 10, verse 42, he he's talking to, to two women in the Bible. Now, one of specifically he's talking to, her name's Martha, and he tells her name twice, right? Martha, Martha. <laughs> Thou art wearied and cumbered about. You're doing all the things. Look at, I'm pretty sure I could see him pointing his hand to Mary. What did he say to her? He said, Mary hath chosen the good part and it shall not be taken away from her so it's good for uh, for me for you to draw near to God 
In fact, it's so good that it won't be taken away from us, which means it's an, it's an eternal investment, and God keeps good books. It's not just with tithe and offerings, but it's your time. It's your time with him and spending with him. Why do we do what we do? I have no business being up here ever unless I have spent long alone with him, with him. So it's good for us to draw near to him, choosing that good part and knowing that that is an eternal investment that it won't be taken away from us. So what happens when we draw near to God? Well, let's look at a few stories. Let's look at a few stories of, of people that drew near to God. If you've been in the Old Testament, you know some of those stories. So how about Shining Moses? Yeah, remember him? He went up into the mountain, spent time with God, got the commandments, did, had to do it twice because he was disobedient, he broke them. God reminded him, the ones you broke. Yeah, here he is. He has to see God's face, right? And, and he came down off the mountain, and the, the, the veil had to be covered because people were not, they couldn't even look at him. He was so bright. He was so bright. He was shining. He was shining. I'm, I'm, we're establishing, establishing this foundation. Let's all be reminded of these stories. They're beautiful. Second Chronicles 5, 11 through 14. Do you all remember what happened there? Here they are. They're about to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into the temple. Here they are. They're bringing it back in. And the Levites and the singers and everybody, they're singing and they're praising the Lord. And what happens? They're drawn near to God. They're bringing the, the Ark of the Covenant that, that the presence of God would hover over and be behind this big old curtain called the veil, right? And here you have, they're, they're bringing it in. They're, they're, they're establishing this, this, the beauty. They're, they're going to get to be with the Lord. And what happened? A glory cloud filled the house. And the priest could not even speak because the glory had filled the house that day. They couldn't minister, they couldn't, they couldn't get up and, and read the Bible. The, the presence of God, there was a cloud. What would y'all do if a cloud literally just came right in here and just like hovered over this, this sanctuary in here? Wouldn't that, you'd be, I, I, we would all be on our face. We would all be on our face. So, what is amazing about this is that in, if God is that detailed, like from Exodus chapter, I think it's like 23 to like 40-something. So 20-something chapters, God has given details about the temple. He's talking about how, how, long, how, how, how it should be built, what it should, should be built with. He even, he even talked about what the priests should wear. How many times they, they could come into the Holy of Holies. The sacrifice and all of the things. Y'all, if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. It gets detail after detail after detail. 2 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11 says, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Do y'all get that? We're about to find out a little bit more about that verse. All right, I know y'all like, okay, Angela, we're with you, but like, what's going on? Y just hang on, strap on, we're about to run this ride, it's gonna be great. If God was that detailed again, that serious, about that Old Testament temple, that Old Testament temple, how much more serious is he about the temple that he died for? Wow. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same, do we think it's different now? Do we think that somehow he's changed his, his majesty and, and sovereignty from the Old Testament temple? You know, the poor guy that was just trying to grab the Ark of the Covenant? You know, what happened to him? He died right there on the spot. The very presence of God. Wow. Wow. If God is that detailed, how much more is he detailed about the temple he died for? Guess what? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says that what? Question mark. <laughs> what? Know ye not that 
your body is now the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. And you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. We sang about it in a hymn just a minute ago. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, why is it there? It's there for this reason. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which, by the way, again, is God's. We're not our own. We're not our own. Do, you, we, do we think that the same presence of God that was back in that Old Testament temple, that the glory cloud had filled the house and all of those things and how amazing that was? Think about another, another example of, of someone who drew near to God. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah looked and he saw. He saw the, the cherubims and the, and the beauty of all of what God was, what he, the Lord opened up his eyes to see that. And what was his response? Woe is me. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And then his next response was what? God said, who will go? I will. Go, pick me. Pick me, I'll go. I'll tell the world about you. Pick me. So we have to establish who we're coming to. Who we're coming to. I want y'all to turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. The Lord does this to me. I do all the notes, and I have all the notes in here, and then he does this. <laughs> He's so awesome. Okay. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Starting in verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. That the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, ye remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away, who? In who? In Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding the in a gla as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. What a beautiful God we serve. How amazing is he? Man, I love this. So we're going to go on this quest. We're going to talk about the elements and all of the details of the temple from a spiritual perspective, from a place of, of an application, right? We're get, we know that the temple, that the Old Testament temple was made, and they had certain things, and we understand that, and we know that God is serious. But I want us to go through this, and I want us to look at all of the details and apply it to our lives spiritually, because every single element in this temple points to Jesus. From the beginning of time, God has tried to make a way to be with his people, to meet with us. But sin came. It came into the camp. It came into the garden. Right? Eve was beguiled by the serpent. She sinned. She gave it to her husband to sin. They sinned. They were kicked out of the garden. The, the relationship was severed with God Almighty. So he had to send, he had to send a perfect spotless lamb, which was his son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation, which means to be the payment, to be the payment for my sin, because I can't come to a holy God unless the blood has been applied. It can't happen. We just sang about it. Has the blood been applied to your life? You've been bought with a price. Regardless, if you are a Christian or not a Christian, he paid for you all. You have a choice to accept it. So we're going to enter into this thing. We're going to enter into this, this temple. And the first thing, as we walk into that eastern gate, 
We walk into the entrance of this Old Testament temple, and we're going back to history. We see the altar of sacrifice. It's the first thing that you see when you go into that temple. The Word of God says in Ephesians 5, 2, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us, for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So that very first thing was the sacrifice. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. We have to be able to see that first. I can't go to the next thing unless I have received the offering, the gift of salvation, the sacrifice that was done for me, my life. That's, that should have been my cross. That should have been me on that cross. I deserve hell because of my sin. The sacrifice, Jesus, so we accept that sacrifice. Now, we see that beautiful, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Now, the next element, we're going to go through this quickly. Are y'all ready? <laughs> I, already, I already asked that. Okay, labor of washing. So you have this labor of washing, and I thought it was so amazing because Ephesians talks about he washes us with the water of the word. He washes us with the water of the word. So John 4.10, again, I said this a little bit ago, was the scripture that the Lord gave me when I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart and life. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is, that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee, what? Say it, say it, living water. So you have this labor of washing. So we've asked Jesus Christ, if you have asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, and he has applied his blood to your soul, your soul, you are his, you accepted the gift of sacrifice, and now you, now you are establishing this relationship so he's wanting to give you a good old spiritual bath and wash all of the lies, all of the things that you say about yourself, all the things the enemy is trying to keep you bound with, everything. He's wanting to wash that out of your life. And the way that that happens, ladies, is by being in this word. Out of all the books in the world, this is the only one that is alive. The word of God says it quickens me. That word quicken means it makes me alive. It feeds me spiritually. It gives me drink when I need it. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. So he washes all of those lies away. And so now we, we're, we're, we've received that living water and we, we're amazed and it has quenched us. And what's amazing about the Lord is that he not only quenches our thirst, but he makes us long for more. So we're longing for more. We're wanting to continue to draw near to him. We can't get enough of him. It was right after in August of 2003 that I finally saw the face of Jesus. This is how he sees me. Psalm 27, 8 says, When thou saidest unto me, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord will I seek. It's drawing near to him. So as I get, I'm getting near to him, I, I never, I look down August 16th, and it's, it's, I look at the clock and it's like 6 a.m. It's time to get the kids up, right? I, I can't believe that I have been with the Lord for six hours. And, and like before, it took me everything I had to just stay in my attention trying to stay focused because I can I could back I could read like three chapters and then go back and go what did I just read anybody I, I have trouble with that even now where I just feel like I have to just get back into it and have to read it again and again and again then I'm like okay I'm just going to read it out loud because I can't focus but back then it was just this I couldn't get enough I just gorged myself I had to have more and my husband woke up the next day and he's like have you been up all night? You didn't come to bed? I'm like, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> I met Jesus last night. He's like, I thought you were saved. No, no, no. Oh my goodness, no. It, that is so not what salvation is. <laughs> like, I met him. 
the man. I met him. He sat right here with me on my couch, and we've been talking for six hours, and I was wide awake. <laughs> I never went to bed. And he's like, okay. And it was right after that that I just, I kept, getting, I kept wanting to draw near. I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough of Jesus. And it was, it was this most amazing thing to me. I had to tell everybody. As I begin to know him, I begin to trust him with my life, not only just my eternity, but my every day. You know, we, he, we sang a, min, a minute ago in, in Christ alone, he commands my destiny. We believe him for our future. We know he has our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life if you called on Jesus to save you. But how come we have trouble with just the everyday stuff? You know, the little things that are just kind of insignificant. Well, I don't want to bother him with that. Oh, my goodness. He is acquainted with all that. All that. So as I'm sitting there and I'm, I've got, you know, it was before I didn't have a computer. I didn't have an iPhone. It, you know, that was way a long time ago before I had the flip phone, you know, the Nokia and the beeper and all that. Uh -huh. Y'all remember those? I had a turquoise one. Uh -huh. I was cool. I was cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and you know, you were, you were the, you were the bee's knees if you had that and you were just like, I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> I've got my beeper. And so I didn't have 25 cents to call back on a payphone for whoever was trying to reach me, but <laughs> that's right. But regardless, I couldn't get enough of him. And it was, Michael would come home for lunch and I was still in the same spot that I was in from the morning. And it would just be days and days and days of this. And I was establishing, as I was drawing near to him, he was drawing near to me, James 4 says. And I began to, to understand who he was. And I established this relationship with him that had so much trust in every day. And I realized that I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live anymore. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that you see, I live by the faith of the Son of God, by the way, who loved me and gave himself for me. We get to do this. It's our reasonable service. So I'm, I'm learning him, I'm, I'm trusting him now. So I've got this relationship with Jesus and now I gotta tell somebody. I can't keep it in. This is the most greatest gift that's ever been given to me. I've gotta tell people. I can't keep my mouth shut. So my daughter at the time we were going to, we were living in Katy, Texas. And, and we, were, we were, I met a friend and I started sharing with her about Jesus. And she was an atheist. She didn't believe there was a God. And, and she had kids and our daughters were, were friends. And I didn't, it was just happening. Understand that when you put a cup under a faucet and you turn the faucet on and you're watching the water fill the cup up and you go to grab that glass of water and it's spilling out all over the, all over the glass, right? And you've got this cup, and, and, and you go to grab it, and you walk away. The cup's still there. What's, I've got water all over me. The cup did not, I don't have evidence that the cup was on me. I have evidence of what was inside the cup. And so I'm looking at my, my sink and all the dishes around it that I didn't wash the night before. And there's this cup, and the water's spilling out. And God's saying to me, Angela, I want you to be the cup. I want you to die. I want you to stay under this living water so that when you go out into the world, they're not touched by you. They're touched by me. So when you stay under the living water and you're filling your life up every day, when you open up mouth, your, my, wide your mouth, he's going to fill it with his words. And that's what they're going to hear. So this young lady was a friend of mine. Well, she, it was the most amazing thing. She I didn't even realize what was taking place. I was just so in love with the Lord. It, it was this just, I just wanted her to know him. And it wasn't just this, you know, beating him over the head with the, you know, your 95 pound Bible that would make a, make a, uh, you know, a, <laughs> a stand go all the way to the floor. You're just, you're just loving. You're just letting Jesus be seen. That's what happens. That's all he asks of us is that we would die so that Christ could be magnified in our life. And so she's starting to see this thing, and she just walked up to me and said, Angela, you get on my nerves. And I'm like, I'm sorry. She's like, no. She's like, you're just 
all you talk about is Jesus. I don't understand that. But when Jesus becomes your everything, that's all you want to talk about. That's all you want to talk about. And so she just, I'm like, well, you just keep coming around. So you, it must be doing something. And so one day she's finally just like, Angela, you just, oh, fine, fine. Give me a Bible. I'll go read it. So she starts reading the Bible. And she's, she's been coming over. And I mean, I'm, this, it's, it wasn't something that was hard for me to do. I was just talking about this man that I met. And his name is, happens to be Jesus. You know he's God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. His name is Jesus. He saves souls. Do you want him? Like, he'll, he'll, he'll command your destiny. Like, he loves you so much. He loves you so much. And she's like, Angela, <laughs> let me have your Bible. So she went and got into John, started reading about this Jesus I kept talking about. And the next morning, she knocks on my door and brings me one of my Bibles back. And I opened the door to somebody that did not even look like the same girl I had seen the night before. And the first words out of her mouth were, I met your Jesus last night. And that was in 2003. And immediately in August of 2003, Angela gets saved. My friend Tammy gets saved. And then her husband gets saved. And it's just this cup. It just fills up and then it spills out in another one and then another one and another one. And then all of a sudden, mom and dad, it's December time. It's Christmas time in December 2003, and Dad's preaching at our church there, and I remember like it was yesterday. I'm ironing my shirt, getting ready for church. Michael, my husband, decides to go with, with my dad early to the, to the uh, church because he's teaching a Sunday school lesson. And so here we are, and I'm like, Mom, <laughs> some people are going to get saved today. I just know it. And I'm like, hey, Dad, what you preaching on today? And he's like, you know, the night before he told me he was, you know, I was, wanted to make sure he was preaching on the same message because I had been praying and he said, I'm preaching about Judas Iscariot. At Christmas time? You preaching Jude about Judas? Okay. He's like, the title of the message is, Is It I, Lord? And you know, y'all, if you've read about Judas, you know that he was the one who betrayed Jesus. And I just, I'm like, okay, well, bring that message. So we're sitting in service. And you, if you know my dad, he don't play around with the altar call. And he's like, you know who you are. Jesus wasn't ashamed of you. You don't be ashamed of him. You know that you have never called on Jesus to save your life. I want you to step out of that chair right now. And I want you to come to this old-fashioned altar and ask Jesus to come save you. And cry out to him. Confess, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and thou shalt be saved. And all of a sudden, I feel this brisk of air right here, because my husband was sitting right here. And I'm like, did he understand the question? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, shh, be quiet. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. And he ran down the aisle, and there five other people got saved that day, but one of them was my husband. And awesome. God just kept doing it. People were getting saved. And I printed out all of these things, and, and I was like going door to door, and, and, I, and I was like, are you a stay-at-home mom? Because I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. Are you a stay-at-home mom, and you're just asking yourself, is this all life has to offer you? And I was going around in Houston, Texas, and putting them on all the doors of the, of the subdivisions. And I walk home, and Michael sees it, and he goes, what is this? I'm like, what? He goes, uh, am I going to have to expect like 30 women in the neighborhood to show up at, the, at our house? I'm like, maybe. And so it was just this, I just couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough of Jesus. He was my everything. It wasn't this, this, you know, my parents' faith anymore. You know, God doesn't have grandchildren. He doesn't. It wasn't off of their faith. It was my own now. And I knew Jesus for myself. So as I'm, as I'm washing in this water of the word, and he's washing me with this labor of washing, and I'm establishing this relationship, this trust, because there's a vulnerability when you take a bath, right? 
And you have, to, you have to just get naked before the Lord, no pun intended, and just bear everything. He knows it all anyway. God, wash me. Whatever's in my life that is not, is not allowing me to come near to you. The Word of God says in James 4, draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Like, I, it's, it's not one leg in the world and one in the word. I have been bought with a price. My mind should be the mind of Christ. Whatever I, I can't have a mind of Christ if I don't know what's on his mind. This is what's on his mind. This is what's on his mind. So you're all like, we've only gotten to the labor of washing. When are we going to get to the next thing? All right, here we go. Y'all ready? So we're walking through the door. We're walking through the door. Guess who the door is? John 10, 7, 11 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the shepherd, but sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, what? He shall be saved. Amen. He is the door. That is how we get. The word of God, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. The door. The door. We're on this quest. We're headed to the Holy of Holies. Here we go. So the table of showbread. You're, you've walked into this place. If you can imagine, we've now in the actual tabernacle. So you have certain things that are in this tabernacle. You have the table of showbread. You have the candlestick. And you have the altar of incense. The first thing we're going to talk about is the table of showbread. John 6.35 says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Not maybe, not sometimes, never. Never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Wow. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is our sacrifice, he is our living water, and he is the bread of life. You know, I, I think back on, on, if you've read the Bible through and you read, you read those stories about how Moses and how, you know, they woke up, had to get up really early, and the manna that came down from heaven, and in the morning they had to gra gather what they needed. In the morning, how many have got morning people in here? Oh, yeah, good. Y'all are not my people. <laughs> No, you are. I'm just teasing. The older I get, the more of a morning person I have, I've become. But I will tell you this. In the morning, if you struggle with getting up, it's a struggle for me for many, many years. But it's worth it when you start your day with Jesus, the bread of life. So here you have, and now you have the candlestick. What an amazing thing this is. And it was massive. We think a little candlestick, you know, like you're walking through this thing. This thing was massive. And it lit... It was the only light that was in the temple. There was no other candlesticks anywhere else. It was the only light in the temple. The word of God says, then John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Praise the Lord. He is all these things. Everything that we are lacking in, he is the supply. Jesus. It's not that he just gives us something. He does. He gives us eternal life. He gives us, he gives us manna. He can, but he is the bread of life. He is living water. It's, it, which means he is in never short supply of because that is who he is. So it also says in 1 John that God is love. Right? And if he is love, and it's not just that he gives you love or he gives you mercy, he gives you himself. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. He feedeth me among the lilies. He is always in full supply every single day, giving every single one of us everything we need for that day. <laughs> just like they did. In the Old Testament, they gathered what they needed for that day. For that day. He is will, he's ready. Draw near to me. Draw near. I will give you everything. It amazes me when 
I know I was supposed to wake up, but I hit the snooze like 14 times. And I, I wake up and I, I, I'm like, man, and I read just really fast and I go in throughout my day and then this big thing happened. You know, one of those circumstances that you just, if I had read and stayed where I needed to stay with the Lord, I would have been able to handle this way better, <laughs> way better. So, all right, we've established this candlestick that's lighting the whole temple. And then you have the altar of incense. I love this thing. This thing is right before you get into, you pass the veil. So it's right in front of the veil. And y'all know if you've read the Old Testament, it talks about the veil, how massive that thing was, how thick it was, what colors it should be made of, what it, was, what it looked like. It's beautiful. But here you have this altar of incense, and this is smack dab, and it's not really in the middle. I didn't do a really good job, but it was in the middle of the temple. So how neat is it that in Galatians 4, 6, it says that God hath sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. When you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit indwells you. The Holy Spirit of God. There's three. They are one. The God the Father the Word, and the Spirit. First John says, and these three are one. It's hard to understand it, but we believe it because that's what the Word says. And thy Word, John, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Amen. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. So the altar of incense, you have this establishing this. They would put the beauty, the beautiful smell of like myrrh and frankincense and just the aroma, the aroma that would fill this temple. Well, in Revelations 5, 8, I love this verse. I was uh, years ago, it was back in, before we moved to Decatur, Alabama, I, we were living in uh, Lufkin, Texas, and I was, I was just so hungry to meet with other brothers and sisters in Christ to have a time of prayer. And not just, you know, the typical prayer meetings that you come in on a Wednesday night, and, and, and no offense, I, I don't think y'all do this, but <laughs> the years ago, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, an old Baptist, Baptist uh, service on a Wednesday night would be, Everybody giving all the grocery list of prayer requests, and then one guy would get up here, maybe the, the deacon would pray for 15 minutes to kind of blanket all of the prayer requests, and then we'd go home. Well, I searched and searched and searched and searched and searched and searched in Scripture, and I can't find that, that example in the Word anywhere. Anywhere. And so I'm like, Lord, I'm just hungry. I'm hungry to pray what you want me to pray. So Galatians 4, 6 says that he has sent the spirit of his son into my heart, crying, Abba, Father. What is he saying? I can tell you what he's saying. He's saying this right here. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. When you pray, this is how y'all ought to pray. So it's corporate. Jesus said, when the disciples said, teach us to pray. Jesus said, if he was from the south, he would said it like this. When y'all pray. This is how y'all ought to pray. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, give us this day. It's corporate. It's corporate. We don't do it enough, ladies. We don't do it enough. So I was in Psalm, and y'all forgive me. I think it said the Lord's, he's doing it again. Look what he's doing. Psalm uh, 146. Psalm 146, verse 18. Psalms 146. Verse 18, so what should we pray? You know, back then I was like, we started meeting. There was about four couples, and we were like, well, you know, let's, let's make a commitment for one year, for one year, to, to, to pray all night. We'll start at 9 o'clock, and we'll have all-night prayer meetings every Friday for one year and see what God does. Let's just do it. Y'all, you remember the, and then, and then they were like, all night long, Angela? Yeah, and then I came back with this. Remember the night when you stood up all night for the devil? You went to the bars and you drank and you stayed up till like 3 or 4 in the morning? <laughs> Why don't we stay up all night for Jesus? <laughs> they were like, okay. <laughs> there was about four couples. 
My husband, I, hey, I brought my kids. We brought cots and tablets and let them play. There was a whole, you know, section in the church that had all kinds of playground stuff. <laughs> we, we met over there where the playground stuff was. And so they, were, they played, and they, we brought them their pillows and their blankets, and they went to sleep, and we kept on praying. And we didn't stop until the Lord tell us, told us to stop. I'm like, how, and before, I would be like, how, how can you pray that long? Well, you start in Genesis, <laughs> and the Lord will direct your steps. The Word of God tells us that. Verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in what in truth thy word is truth so what do we need to call upon him with the word it's simple he made it so simple so lord i've got all kinds of circumstances and, and i feel like you're not you know no nope. angela i'll take care of that you draw nigh to me you draw nigh to me and trust me get to know me delight in me Establish that delight in me first. Then seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all of these things will be added unto you. Seek me first. Establish that first. Fall in love with me first. Jesus said in Revelation, go back to the first works. Remember from when thou art fallen, and repent, and go back to the, what are the first works? The first works, remember when you were so in love with Jesus? When you couldn't get enough of him? But then something happened, and then you got mad at God. How could you do this to me? Last year, 20, 2021, it was this time last year that I lost my voice. <laughs> it wasn't COVID, it wasn't none of that. Of course, COVID was COVID, right? But, you know, everything's COVID now, right? It wasn't COVID. But I knew that the Lord had called me into prayer ministry for our church and to lead that in that effort and taking Decatur Baptist and gathering a bunch of people and then just doing this thing, living out the scripture, drawing near to God. And, and to just really just understanding that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then Mark chapter, chapter 10, you know, of all the places that Jesus was angry in the Bible, it wasn't when he was casting out devils or feeding the 5,000 or walking on the water. It was when he was in the temple. And he sees what's going on. And he sees that the money changers and the robbers, and they're doing stuff in the temple that he did not intend for it to be about. And he didn't say, my house shall be called a house of preaching or a house of, you know, decorating cakes or whatever. My house shall be called a house of prayer. So, I take the Bible literal. In that, as in that aspect, I take it literal. That he's telling me, Angela, you are to pray. Did we not establish that we are now the temple? That we've now been bought with a price? That we don't have to go to a temple once a year and apply a sacrifice and a priest? We couldn't even go in there, by the way. We had to let a priest do it for us. Once time a year, one time a year, he would have to go in and sprinkle the blood over the mercy seat for the atonement for the sin of the people. We would have to travel by an airline ticket to go, you know, across the pond, all that one time a year. We don't have to do that anymore. We can talk to him in the shower. We can talk to him in this room right here. Hey, guess what? This is just brick and mortar. <laughs> he's not, he's, I'm not saying that God can't bring a glory cloud right in here right now, and he can because he's God. But he's not interested in this brick and mortar. He's interested in you, in you. He wants you. He wants you. And I'm telling you, as I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the everybody and we begin to start talking about this thing. So for one year, <laughs> one year we prayed. Friday night, starting at 9 o'clock, for one year. Sometimes we'd go till 11, sometimes we'd go to 9.30, sometimes 6 a.m. But the Holy Spirit set the agenda by the Word of God. And it was the most powerful, monumental moments of my life. 
and I have never been the same because of it, because I saw cancer healed, but we weren't asking for him to heal cancer. That's the most amazing thing about it, was we just wanted him. We weren't asking him to, to, do, to provide the needs or to provide groceries or any of that. We were just wanting him more. We were seeking him first and wanting what he wanted to glorify him alone. And he did it. <laughs> he did it. So now we're moving on. We've got the altar of incense. And what I love about this, before I move on, Revelations 5.8. I said this and we didn't read the scripture yet. I'm so sorry. I, I chase rabbits, but they're spiritual rabbits. <laughs> they're saved. Okay. Um, Revelations 5.8. This is a beautiful thing. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. This hadn't happened yet. Having, for, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Y'all, remember what we talked about at the beginning? How Mary, how Mary chose the good part and it wouldn't be taken away from her? Your prayers... When you pray the word of God, number one, Isaiah 55 says that it does not return void. He pays attention when, oh, that, I wrote that. They pray in the word. I wrote that. All right. They believe in by faith that I'm going to do that. Pray the word of God. It won't return void. In fact, it will accomplish what it's been sent to do, and it will prosper, Isaiah 55 says. That whole chapter, go read it. It's awesome. It's all awesome. Okay, so these prayers, they are your prayers. By the way, the only, the only prayers that are worthy enough to enter the throne room are the words of God. So when you pray the word of God by faith, they are filling the aroma of heaven. And God is breathing that into his nostrils. How amazing is that? God Almighty, you are filling the aroma of heaven by your prayers. That's an amazing thing. That's an eternal investment. That's choosing the good part. And it's not going to be taken away from you. Well, I want all kinds of my prayers up in there. Oh, oh here she is again. Here she is again. Okay, so now we have gotten to the veil. My favorite, my favorite thing. So, I say, I think I, everything is my favorite. I feel like that's my favorite adjective is favorite. Um, but here you are, you've gotten to the veil. And what's amazing about this thing is that it's back in, in Jesus's time, right before he died. And uh, many of you may already know this, but I thought this was so incredible. How I was reading these scriptures and how it was telling me that, that you know, Jesus is the veil, right? The veil that was torn. We sing songs about it. You know, you get to that part, you get to that part where the veil's been torn. Hallelujah. You can come now boldly to the throne room of grace to obtain that grace and that mercy in our time of need. I need you. Every hour I need him. Every hour I need him. The veil, Hebrews 10, 20. Hebrews 10, 20 says, By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the the veil that is to say his flesh the veil was torn jesus was torn back in that day when jesus was nailed to that cross and he said it is finished it is finished i came to do what i was supposed to do i did it it is finished the veil was torn from top to the bottom now, if you think about that, you know, kind of like a vel velvet uh, material or something thick, like a thick material, you know, just establishing, that, just holding on to something like that. If you have like a dress or a velvet, you know, just if you have something like that in your, in your, in your closet, um, kind of see if you could tear, you can't tear that. And that's just something so small. This veil back in Herod's temple, which was with the temple at the time, Herod's temple, this temple was... The, this veil was about five and a half stories high. Ancient Hebrew 
findings tell us that it was approximately five and a half stories. It was about the width of a man's hand, or anywhere from four inches thick, and it weighed, it weighed anywhere from 18,000 to 28,000 pounds. You talk about massive. When God, when Jesus said, it is finished, the earth quaked and the veil was torn in two. You don't have to come just once a year anymore. You can come now boldly because of the blood of Jesus. The veil that is to say his flesh, he made a way for you to talk to him, to be with him every single day, to be in his presence every day. Wow, we get to know him. Jesus said, if you knew to the Samaritan woman, if you knew this gift of God, hey, guess what? We get to know him. We get to know him. It's not, we don't have to do that anymore. So now the veil has been torn. We've now entered into the Holy of Holies. Y'all, this is amazing. We've made it. We're here. We've gotten, we've got, we're here. Awesome. He made a way for us to know God. The word says in Hebrews 12, 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, hallelujah, and to the blood of sprinkling that speak better things than that of Abel. He had spr he has sprinkled his blood. Now we can come into the presence of God. We can come boldly now. And I love that, that what's in the Ark of the Covenant, that just to know these things and how they point, even the articles that are in the Ark point to Jesus. Every single one of them. Every single thing in the Ark. It says that there that there's three things in the ark, right? Y'all say them out loud for me. Aaron's budded rod, the, the Ten Commandments, and the bowl of manna, right? So you have, you have Aaron's budded rod, rod. John 15 says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If any man abide in me and I in him. Wow. He is that branch. He is the branch, Isaiah says. Our Jesus. The, and then the Ten Commandments. The word of God, the law, Psalm 119, thy law, I delight in thy law. There's, I love the Psalm 119, it's got 176 verses of precepts, statutes, you know, all of the things, the, thy words, delights, all of the things, they have one common denominator, ladies, and that's Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelations, he says that I am the, I am from, I'm the Alpha, and I am Omega. I am everything in between. This is who he is. He is the word. In the beginning was the word. When you read this, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, open up mine, open up wide my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let him speak to him, pray, ask him, show me. It's a treasure hunt. The word says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7 that, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The treasure is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, his word dwelling in us richly every single day, living off of that. And I love the bowl of manna. There's a bowl of manna in there. Manna, representation of Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Not like the Moses manna that came down from heaven, I am the bread of, of heaven. I am. I am. But not, we don't really put emphasis on the bowl. But there was, says that it says it, that there's a bowl of manna. Well, that's who we need to be. We need to let the word of Christ fill these bowls. Fill these bowls. So when we get out in the world, that's what's coming out. That's what's coming up. That's what people are, are experiencing, that treasure, that beautiful treasure. So amazing that he is. Amazing. I can't get enough. So as we're reading all of this, as we know that we've established this, this relationship with Jesus Christ, and he, all of the elements in the temple point to him, I'm going to ask Miss Catherine, come on up here. Come on, girl. Give, give a hand to y'all's women's director. Woo! She's such a blessing. I love you. We love you. You've accepted Jesus Christ.
Christ in your heart and life. That you are you are a child of God. And First Corinthians six nineteen and twenty says that what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? We have established this whole thing that that the temple is. And we, you've got a paper, and bless your hearts, it's not the greatest, <laughs> but we know that everything points to Jesus. This life. This body that you see is the temple of God. The very presence of God that once filled a temple now dwells in this, this thing that you see. This beautiful creature. She is a temple of God. Y'all, the very presence. You couldn't go into the, you couldn't go, the powerful presence of God. Y'all, I, are y'all getting this? Dwells in Catherine. Girl, you've got the presence of God dwelling in you. Yes, I do. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you. You're such a, she's so good. Thank you. Thank you for being my example. She had no idea. She's like, oh. She, yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. If you have called on Jesus to save you. Very presence of God dwells in you. We shouldn't take it for granted. We shouldn't take it for granted. Every single day, I can wake up and spend time and bust through that holy of holies because there ain't no veil no more. And I can spend time with the one who died for me, who gave me everything that I need that pertains to life and godliness for his glory. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple? I'm gonna ask the praise team to come. I'm gonna ask them to come and play. <clears throat> We're gonna have a time of, of just getting real. Just getting real, take the mask off. God sees your heart, he knows. He knows what's, what what you are struggling with, what you came in here with. He knows that, that you are, he wants to take all of that. He just said, look at me. Hebrews 12, 1 says, looking unto Jesus, fix your eyes on the one who died for you. Fix your eyes on the one that made a way for you to know him. Fix your eyes on Jesus. So every head bowed, every eye closed.